Good morning or good afternoon. <laughs> um, we have uh, an FBI investigator and uh, apparently he wrote up some stuff that the defense thinks is the script for the closing argument. So I think we've got some time uh, is spent on uh, whether or not the jury can hear that or uh, or whether the FBI can agent can refer to it. Anyway, it's a short session today, so uh, well, let's roll roll film. Thank you. Please be seated. All right, good morning. We're going on the record on case CR 2221-1624, State of Idaho versus Lori Noreen Vallow. This is the continuation of the jury trial in this case. The state continues putting on its case in chief. Prosecutions here present as well as the defendant and her attorneys. Uh, before we bring the jurors in this morning, we had ended yesterday with a argument as to a proposed exhibit, which uh, the court made a ruling on yesterday, indicating that the exhibit as proposed would not be admissible. Uh, the court's been advised now that an updated amended exhibit has been prepared and due to the nature of the legal argument, I think it would be appropriate to hear the issue before we bring the jurors in and in the matter of efficiency, um, the court would note, received a courtesy copy of the proposed exhibit and have reviewed that, and I believe the defense has as well. So as we get started this morning, let's talk about uh, the issue of the next witness's proposed demonstrative exhibit, which I believe the state's offering under Rule 1. <laughs> Ms. Smith, I believe you'll make argument as to the admissibility of that exhibit. Is that correct? Yes, Your Honor. All right. If you'd like to present argument at this time, I'll hear that and then I'll give an opportunity for the defense to respond. Thank you, Your Honor. Without repeating the state's position yesterday, the amended exhibit, I believe, addressed the court's concerns. The headers were removed. Any slide, um, and, and we respect and absolutely will do whatever the court, we, we still are, we suggest that it's admissible, but respecting the court's order, we removed any slides that could even border on argument. Um, we removed any slides, even we even removed a timeline which the court had said was allowed. Um, simply, it is simply um, representative text in summary um, and representative data in summary from the iCloud it was cut and pasted directly from what's already been admitted as part of States 29. Um, these, those documents, the iCloud, Lori for Style at iCloud.com, the documents and data in Lori for Lolly Time um, in iCloud.com have already come in. So these, these items are already in evidence and similar to has been allowed for a few witnesses. This witness reviewed and his responsibility within the FBI to review in detail iCloud, he did that. And to aid the jury and to aid him in his testimony, this exhibit would allow him to testify as to texts that reflect um, the content, reflect the ideas um, in the defendant's own words. These texts are the defendant's own words or conversations with her co-conspirators. They are conversations that show the defendant's state of mind, motive, intent. It certainly establishes that there's no mistake in this plan. Um, the probative value of this significant evidence is, um, 
is unparalleled. Um, and Agent Hart has spent hundreds of hours reviewing the iCloud and to ease his testimony, to make it easier for the jury, he prepared this summary and using this summary will aid the jury in reaching questions and um, making an ultimate decision on this case. All right, thank you, Ms. Smith. Uh, I believe Mr. Thomas, are you gonna make <clears throat> an uh, argument in opposition? Yes, Your Honor. Um, so uh, I received this uh, last night, the final version shortly after eight o'clock. Uh, we were reviewing that last night and this morning. Uh, and in our review, we found uh, multiple pages that have impermissible hearsay. I understand that the court uh, is willing to allow in uh, hearsay of co-conspirators pursuant to evidentiary rule, but on pages 2, 5, 7, 15, 43, 46, 72, 73, 75, 80, 81, 82, 83, and 84, there are numerous uh, impermissible hearsay statements uh, from either witnesses who have testified already or witnesses who have not been called, um, uh, including Melanie Boudreau, Cole Vallow, Zach Vallow, some unlisted individuals, Audrey Baratario, and Sydney Woodbury. We believe that this is um, far outside of uh, what the what Mr. Hart will be able to testify to. And if he testifies to anything that what these people said, if he gives any commentary, then that's going to be impermissible hearsay. Say, and he's just going to read impermissible hearsay into the record. And so I would ask that this be excluded for those reasons. All right. Thank you, Mr. Thomas. Uh, the representation from the state and court has not gone in and reverse engineered the exhibit to make sure that the summary in proposed 183 is pulled directly out of already admitted evidence which was states 29th that is the continuing representation of the state that in fact all of the communications in 183 are directly from 29 which was previously admitted i apologize my microphone was not on yes your honor in fact um to ease any concerns the defense might have with that we will actually we have actually placed on thumb drives as states exhibits 29C and D, um, the entirety of the lolly time at iCloud.com and the entirety of Lori for style, um, dot com. As we have, our practice has been in this case to prevent hundreds of thousands of pages being flooded the court file. We have admitted the business record certificate and then taken portions of the representative records and admitted those. But to ease any concerns, anticipating what defense counsel might suggest, the entirety of Lolly Time is on one thumb drive, the entirety of Lawyer for Siles is on the other. Um, and we certainly, um, I'm confident that those had been disclosed to the defense a few times, but for these counsel, we know the earliest they got it was in August of 2021. Um, and it was in that production they received. So it's a duplicate of what they received. It has been verified, the copy by Agent Hart. Um, so to, then we can just make sure that the agent can testify to that. All right. Um, the courts then considered this new proposed Exhibit 183 in terms of uh, Idaho Rule of Evidence 1006 and whether or not it's an appropriate summary to prove content of voluminous writings, records uh, that can't be conveniently examined in court and may potentially uh, assist this witness in providing testimony about that voluminous information. Also considered the objection lodged by the defense as a objection relating to hearsay on certain pages of the exhibit. Um, uh, hasn't been argued this morning, but I considered the timing as well of the disclosure. And upon consideration of all that, and in particular also Idaho Rule of Evidence 403, whether or not this may be more prejudicial than probative in a balancing, uh, the court would find that upon review of the exhibit, it would be admissible, uh, assuming the witness lays 
an adequate foundation for the exhibit prior to it being admitted. The hearsay objection is overruled as the court would find that was waived upon the entry of States Exhibit 29, which was previously admitted, I believe, without objection in the case. So these are portions of an already admitted exhibit. Also, in terms of the timing here, because it contains the same content of the previously admitted exhibit, but in a shortened version, and also that it removed the argumentative nature of what was included in there, the court would determine that it now does appropriately comply with Rule 1006 as a summary that may be used by the witness. So I'm making just a provisional ruling at this point, subject to foundation being laid by this witness to get that in. But the concerns raised yesterday have been overcome with the new proposed exhibit. So the objection on those grounds is overruled. Have you heard on a motion to reconsider here? Go ahead. The issue I have, Your Honor, is that if the court doesn't require that the state take these out in these particular pages, 14 different pages, that we, the state has indicated that these are voluminous documents. We had no idea that they were going to pull in these hearsay statements. We had no idea that they weren't going to actually call some of these, a lot of these, any of these people that I've indicated. And it would be ineffective on our part should we just roll over and allow this to happen. And, Your Honor, I believe that, you know, ineffective assistance of counsel is a big deal. And I think that the state could cure this by pulling out those items that were in this hearsay, that are hearsay within this. I understand that it has already been admitted as an exhibit. But to have the jury hear impermissible hearsay just because of a mistake on Ms. Vallow's counsel that we allow this to come in without the objection of hearsay, I think would be detrimental to Ms. Vallow's case. Visit Progressive.com to see if you could save on motorcycle, RV, and boat insurance. All right. Any response to that, Ms. Smith? Well, I respect and admire defense counsel's creative advocacy. One, it's not an impermissible hearsay. It's the defendant's statement. We're not offering the statements of any of the people in there for the truth of the matter asserted other than the defendant. Those provide context for that. So while I applaud the advocacy, the law is clear. The defendant's statements when offered by the state are admissible. The statements of the others are not inadmissible hearsay in that we are not offering for the truth of the matter. For example, the comment that Ned was in Charles has been in multiple times, sometimes without objection. And we're not offering it for the truth of the matter asserted that Ned was in fact in Charles Vallow. We are offering it for the response that the defendant made to this case. So one, it's not an admissible hearsay. Two, defense counsel has multiple reports on this. And the characterization of ineffective is just simply misplaced, though I understand and respect the advocacy. It's just flat out not accurate. The appellate record on this will be clear. And the state has no concerns offering this exhibit in the context it's been put forward and offering and purporting the defendant's own statements. So for that reason, legally, the defense's position is unfounded. All right. Well, I've considered the request to reconsider the ruling offered by Mr. Thomas and the response from the state on each of those pages. I haven't made any determination that it is or is not hearsay. They are statements of other persons apparently contained in those pages. Whether or not they fall within impermissible hearsay has not been determined. What has been determined is the exhibit from whence these come was previously admitted. And to the extent if there is any hearsay in there, it may or may not be permissible hearsay, but the defense will be allowed to cross-examine on those issues as well as it relates to whether or not the credibility could be attacked or they could be impeached if, in fact, it is a hearsay statement, which is inherently less reliable than direct statements. So the court doesn't find a reason to modify my prior ruling based on that finding. So 
that'll be the determination as it relates to the proposed exhibit 183. Before we get started also, as I'm thinking through with this witness counsel, um, the defense had raised an issue yesterday also as it relates to concerns that the witness may have violated the exclusionary rule. If there's going to be extensive argument on that beyond me just doing the normal question I'm giving to all the witnesses, I'm wondering if perhaps we shouldn't start there with the witness also outside the presence of the jury if you think you're going to probe into whether or not the witness may have violated the exclusionary rule. I think it might be more appropriate to do that examination outside of the juror's presence. Yes, your, yes, your honor. You do intend to do that? Yes. Okay. Uh, with that, then I, I would find that it's appropriate to conduct that for Dyer on that issue without the jurors present um, so that we can get into if, in fact, there was any violation of the exclusionary rule, uh, the witness can disclose that without having the jurors hear that information. So uh, if that's where we are on the issue, I would suggest we then call the witness, have him brought in, go through the exclusionary rule issue, and then assuming the witness stays on the stand, we'll bring the jurors in after that if the court does not find that he is excluded. Thank you, Honor. Uh, do you want Agent Hart brought in? Yes, let's go ahead and do that. Then. Your Honor, prior to that, can I just get a, um, a, a ruling that uh, I don't have to make he specific hearsay objections on pages 2, 5, 7, 15, 43, 46, 72, 73, 75, 80, 81, 82, 83, and 84, and that the court's willing to acknowledge for appellate purposes that I have made those objections. I don't want to uh, call specific attention to it, to the jury, to those specific uh, uh, hearsay objections. Is that okay? Yes. So okay. the record will indicate that the defense has now raised objections on those pages as to hearsay on the proposed exhibit that is not yet admitted, but uh, if it does become admitted, then pages 2, 5, 7, 15, 43, 46, 72, 73, 75, 80, 81, 82, 83, and 84 have lodged an objection on hearsay grounds to each of those, and the court will not require you to uh, re-raise the issue before the jurors. Um, and, and again, I don't have those in in front of me. If you think for some reason it should be raised again, you're not prohibited from bringing it up, but it's lodged in the record that you've made your objection. Thank you. Um, you know, if, if the state may at some point get that list, that went pretty fast and that it, we heard about it in chambers, but couldn't write it down fast enough. So if we could get that list, it doesn't, if defense counsel could email it to us or something, just so that we can make sure we're paying attention to that issue as it comes up. Okay. Let me just Read it off for you one more yeah. time. It's Thank you. I'm sorry. Two, five, <laughs> seven, 15, 43, 46, 72, 73, 75, 80, 81, 82, 83, 84. Thank you, Judge. You're welcome. Okay, let's go ahead and have uh, the next witness called and sworn then, and we'll go through an initial voir dire on the exclusionary rule issue. Your Honor, as the witness is taking the stand procedurally, do you want the state to go first on this inquiry or? The court, uh, I just want to make sure I'm standing where I need to be. Yes. So give me just a second, counsel. <clears throat> it's 
sorry, apologies, just one moment. I would have a brief consultation. All right, thank you. Please be seated. <coughs> All right, at this time then, uh, Agent Hart's been placed under oath. The issues arisen as to a uh, potential, I guess, issue raised by the defense as to whether or not there's been a violation of the court's exclusionary rule as it relates to this witness. The court would note it's previously entered an order that prohibits uh, witnesses in the case from seeing or reviewing or being exposed to the trial testimony uh, before they testify. And so because the issue has been raised specifically, I would ask the state if you want to conduct any or dire on the issue of the court's exclusionary order, then I'll allow the defense to cross-examine on that narrow issue. Uh, this is prior to starting any testimony before the jurors, and I'll note on the record the jurors are not present for this stage of the proceedings. Good morning. Good morning. Uh, sir, do you prefer to be called chief deputy or agent? I'm this, used to one, but I know you're something else now. For this case, agent is fine. Okay. Agent Hart, um, were you aware of a court order uh, prohibiting witnesses from um, listening to the trial in this case? Yes. Were you aware that the court's order prohibited you from listening to or reviewing trial testimony of any witnesses? Yes. Did you listen to the trial in any part of this case? No. Did you listen to the trial testimony of any witnesses? No, I have not. Have you reviewed the trial testimony that occurred in the courtroom with anyone? No. Have you reviewed the trial testimony of anyone even through conversation? No. Okay. Has the state shared with you the trial testimony of anyone? No. Um, you have been present for some interviews and pretrial preparation of witnesses, correct? Yes. Have you been part of pretrial preparation of witnesses after those people have testified? No. Has anyone brought to your attention any trial testimony of those witnesses um, at any point? No. Is there any way that you have followed, listened to the trial testimony or the trial proceedings um, that have been available in the public? No. Prior to the trial beginning, we received a strict instruction from the prosecution regarding uh, those matters that we were not to speak with other witnesses regarding their testimony and we were not to watch any uh, television, read any newspaper media, online media regarding the trial. I've obeyed that order rigorously. Okay. Thank you. I have nothing further. Thank you, Agent. All right. Thank you, Ms. Smith. Mr. Archibald, you can inquire. If I understand correctly, you're not with the FBI any longer, but that was your former job. That's correct. And as your former job as an agent with the FBI, uh, was it part of your duties to review all summaries from other FBI uh, witnesses? I review, I guess I don't understand your question when you say FBI witnesses. There's been a number of FBI witnesses who have testified in this trial. Are you aware of that? Yeah, FBI employees? Yes. Yes. Have you reviewed their, their statements? No. Did you uh, coordinate with anyone about what other FBI witnesses were going to say and what you were going to say? I was part of the investigation from its inception. And so during the course of the past three and a half years on a number of occasions, I have met with our FBI analysts, our FBI forensic accountants. I approve reports that they wrote during the course of the investigation, but I have not discussed their testimony with them in any way. So they would uh, prepare a report. You would review that, sign off on it. Correct. 
Has there been anyone from the FBI who's been attending this trial? Objection. Relevance. This is about his exposure to the proceedings in the courtroom. This isn't about who was where. Uh, I'll rephrase the question. Okay, go ahead, Mr. Archer. Is there anyone from the FBI sitting in the courtroom right now? Objection. Relevance. Uh, it's not relevant, I guess, if they're not testifying. Has the person who is from the FBI, who is sitting in this courtroom, have you had conversations with him about what's been happening here in court? No. Have you received any emails or texts from this FBI person who's here in the courtroom? No. Objection. Relevance? It needs to be more narrow than that, Mr. Archibald. It's whether it relates to observation of any trial testimony. So this this FBI person who's in the courtroom, has he provided any information to you about what other witnesses have said? No. Have the prosecutors re relayed any information to you about what witnesses have said? No. In fact, on a number of occasions, I've been asked to leave the room so that they could discuss those matters. Have the local police uh, from Rexburg or Madison County or Fremont County provided you any information about what's been testified here in court? No. All of those individuals have been very cautious and careful, as instructed by the prosecutors, not to discuss those things. Okay. Well, thank you, Agent. All right, Council, with that... Uh line of questioning then the court did not find any rationale behind a objection under the exclusionary rule uh, the witness has indicated compliance with the court's order as it relates to the rule 615 of the Idaho rules of evidence and the order that was entered in the case so I don't find there's been any violation there so with that We'll go ahead and bring the jurors in and the state can commence with its direct examination. Your Honor, while the jury is being brought in, may, Ms., uh, may I and Mr. Wood get set up for the state's direct? Yes. Okay. Will it make it to lunch or should I just keep the plug things?
Executive Office of Personnel Management. Please proceed. Mr. Bailiff, please proceed. All right. Thank you, Mr. Bailiff. Please be seated. Okay, we're on the record on case CR 22-211624, State of Idaho v. Lori Noreen Vallow. The prosecution's here present, as well as the defense and the defendant. The court would note that the jurors are now in the courtroom, all properly seated and accounted for. I believe they've all signed their daily juror affirmation. Is that correct, Mr. Bailiff? Yes, Your Honor. Very well. Thank you again for your continued service and adhering to the court's instructions. In terms of our scheduling, the court will intend to stop at noon today, or roughly around noon if we can. We'll do a mid-morning short break. And I'll note that the state has called its next witness. The witness has been sworn already. We had some testimony as it related to the exclusionary rule argument, and that's been resolved. So the court doesn't have any further inquiry for the witness before you start with your examination. Ms. Smith, if you'd like to commence with direct, you may. Thank you, Your Honor. Good morning, sir. Good morning. Sir, can you introduce yourself to the ladies and gentlemen of the jury and spell your last name? Yes. My name is Douglas Hart, H-A-R-T. Sir, how are you employed? I am currently employed as the chief deputy for the Canyon County Sheriff's Office. The sheriff is the elected official. The chief deputy is second in command underneath the sheriff. How long have you been at the Canyon County Sheriff's Department? Approximately eight months. Okay. How long? Where were you before that? From 1995, September of 1995 through September of 2022, I was employed as a special agent for the Federal Bureau of Investigation. Can you give us a little bit of information on your background as a special agent with the FBI? Certainly. I attended the FBI Academy in Quantico, Virginia and graduated from the Academy. My first assignment was to the Honolulu, Hawaii Division. I was assigned to the Organized Crime and Drug Squad. So during my time in Hawaii, I specialized in long-term, complex, multi-subject investigations. We did a lot of conspiracy cases. I got my first experience in homicide investigations in Hawaii. We had two homicides that my squad investigated that took place on military installations in Hawaii. After five and a half years in Hawaii, I sought out a relatively unique assignment in the FBI. Which was? Wherever there is an Indian reservation, you will find a small satellite FBI office. At any given time, two to three percent of the FBI are designated as Indian country agents. That assignment is unique in that most persons' crimes don't fall under federal jurisdiction. However, for Indian reservations, the FBI along with... Judge, I'm going to object to that this is irrelevant information that he's giving, just to bolster his own credibility. Well, Your Honor, his experience and access to direct investigations into persons' crime is relevant, and it goes to lay a foundation for the findings and observations he made as one of the primary investigators in this matter. All right. Well, I understand laying the foundation. I think at some point the detail might become additional than we need for just foundation for this particular case, but I'll overrule the objection at this point. Thank you, Your Honor. So you were discussing about your investigative background in various Indian reservations. Yes. What else, what other experience did you have as a line investigator in those territories? So I spent seven years on the Nez Perce Indian Reservation working mainly violent crimes and persons' crimes. I investigated a number of homicides and related crimes. Where did you transfer? You said you spent seven years. Well, you're with the FBI longer than that. So where did you transfer to after you went to the Nez Perce Indian Reservation? In 2001, I transferred to the Boise, Idaho Resident Agency. 
where I was assigned as the supervisor for the Treasure Valley Metro Violent Crime Task Force. What were your responsibility as responsibilities as the supervisor for that violent crime task force? So that task force was led and funded by the FBI. Our primary responsibility was to investigate gang violence and organized crime violence, drug trafficking. Uh, so I was the supervisor of the task force, but also a, an investigator on a day-to-day -day basis. Where did you proceed after you were part of the, or head of the violent crime task force? So I spent seven years in that capacity. In June of 2015, I was promoted to be the supervisory senior resident agent. For what the, does supervisory senior agent mean? That means I was the supervisor for all FBI criminal programs in the 34 southern counties of Idaho, which included agents in our Boise office and agents in our Pocatello office. So as the supervisor, did you continue to be involved in direct investigative activity yourself? Absolutely. Why? Um, what's that? Why? <laughs> um, the FBI is fairly minimally resourced in Idaho. Um, I had responsibilities as a supervisor for the agents that worked for me and for their cases, but I also continued to work as a case agent on a number of matters um, that I was able to essentially assign to myself. Um, let's back up just a little bit. What training uh, did you have in terms of investigation and investigative um, supervisory responsibilities? So the initial training for an FBI agent takes place at the FBI Academy in Quantico, Virginia. It's approximately 17 weeks of training over a variety of uh, subject matters. And then uh, subsequent to that, I've attended many what we call in-service trainings uh, that are specific to a specialized law enforcement duty or topic, um, such as crime scene management schools, um, interviewing interrogation schools, uh, written statement analysis schools, so on and so forth. Did you have any training with um, the identification and location of clandestine graves? Yes. Can you tell us a bit about that training? So when you are assigned uh, as an Indian country agent, you attend a special crime scene management school that's a very intensive uh, week-long course that encompasses a lot of uh, different aspects of crime scene management and investigation. Uh, the FBI has evidence response teams, but they were 11 hours away from where I was situated. So we did all of the crime scene work ourselves. Part of that training was the identification and location of clandestine grave sites. What does clandestine grave mean? It means someone has buried a body uh, where they don't want it to be found. And so that's the, the clandestine part of it. And so um, you receive training in the clandestine grave location and identification. Location, identification, as well as grave exhumation. Okay. What does that mean? That means the uh, process of exhuming uh, a body that's been buried. There are um, techniques and measurements that are required as you um, undertake that, that endeavor in a crime scene. It has to be done very carefully and according to uh, strict procedures. And you talked a bit about your training, and now let's talk about approximately how many cases have you been a criminal investigator on in your overall capacity with the FBI? Um, hundreds. It would be hard to put a specific number on it. Approximately how many homicides have you been um, part of the investigation of? I would say conservatively between 20 and 30 homicides. Okay. And how many cases have you been involved in which involve crimes against children? There are lots of types of crimes against children. Um, I've been in, I would say, over 50. Okay. Any of those cases involve investigations into missing or abduct suspected abducted children? Yes, several. 
Okay. Um, what was the, your role? Well, let's do it this way. What was the FBI's role in those cases in investigating missing or potentially abducted children? Well, the FBI um, has nationwide jurisdiction. So if a, a child has been abducted and taken across state lines, then those cases fall under the FBI's purview. But um, more than that, for, for many, many years, the FBI has taken the stance that when a child goes missing, our um, capabilities coupled with those of city, county, or state investigators uh, need to be brought to bear immediately so that we can seek the best outcome in locating and safely recovering those children. So whether or not those cases fall under the federal system, the FBI still responds to cases of missing children and participates fully in those investigations. Whether or not they're the lead, they always support the local law enforcement on trying to find the children. Correct. How many of those cases have you been involved with personally? A, a true uh, a child abduction or missing child case is, is fairly rare. Um, but I have been involved in between six to ten of those cases during my career. And um, in that time, you, you mentioned earlier about responded rapidly. Why is that? Well, we know uh, from studying these cases that um, if a child is going to be killed, they're typically killed within 24 hours of being abducted. And so you have a, a very small window in which to respond and uh, utilize all of the tools and resources that we have uh, working cooperatively with our partners to try to locate and recover that child. Your Honor, as a procedural matter and to aid in getting ready for some exhibits, the state requests permission um, to display state's exhibit 29C and 29D. The entirety of 29 is the I, are the iCloud records for Lori uh, Fallow, um, as documented through Lolly Time at iCloud.com and Lori for Style at iCloud.com. C and D are the entirety of both. Um, records, uh, and given that in a few minutes we'll be displaying some of those, I, I need to move for those admissions right now so that Mr. Wood can get resources up. All right. Can you clarify for me? Uh, previously, we've admitted 29. Is that correct? Yes, Judge. Those were those records were admitted uh, with the stipulation on the business record certification with the defense. Um, and A was as to, let me pull up my exhibit list so I don't misstate. <coughs> 29A was the, um, the certified business records for Lori for Style at iCloud.com. 29B was the certified records for Lolly Time at iCloud.com. C is the entirety of Lori for Style at iCloud.com. Um, and D was the entirety of Lolly Time at iCloud.com. And C and D have been previously admitted? Well, the entirety of 29 has been admitted um, because it's the records that would go with the certified attachment. We just hadn't published those or offered them in the courtroom yet. As we've done on all our sort of voluminous records, we admit the business record certification and then we display specific pages. But given um, some rulings of the court, we're, we're, we have the entirety of the actual documents that are part of 29 in the two exhibits, C and D. Okay, well, they are separate exhibits, so still I don't believe they've been offered and admitted. So for purposes of the record, before we begin any kind of publishing from them or reference, I think we need to go through that procedure. Okay, Your Honor. May I ask the witness be shown State's Exhibit 29C and 29D, please? Yes. Thank you, sir. Has the 
Has a copy of this been provided to the defense? Um, yes, in exhibit in August of 2021. That's the documents you were given in discovery. It's the iCloud accounts provided in August of 21. All right, go ahead, Ms. Speaker. Thank you. Agent, um, looking at, do you recognize states 29 C and D? I do. How do you recognize two thumb drives? Uh, on these two thumb drives are the copies of the Lori 4 style at iCloud.com, iCloud contents, and the Lolly Time at iCloud.com contents. Um, my initials are on each of these thumb drives. Okay. And you helped prepare those to make sure that they, you could make sure those records as part of the business records were the ones you observed, you looked at. That's correct. Okay. And you observed those. And the only thing on those two thumb drives are the entirety of Lori for Style at iCloud.com and the entirety of Lolly Time at iCloud.com. Yes. Okay. C is Lori for Style at iCloud.com. Yes. And D is Lolly Time at iCloud.com. That's correct. Okay. How do you know that? Because I'm the one who made the copies of the thumb drives. From the business records? Correct. Okay. And the thumb drives are marked? Yes. Move okay. for the admission of States Exhibit 29C and 29D. Any objection? Yes, Your Honor. We would object to any hearsay contained therein, and we believe uh, that there is multiple uh, layers of impermissible hearsay. So we'd ask the court not to admit those. All right, what's the response from the state? Your Honor, the, any statements of the defendant in her own words are being um, reflected in that document. Any statements of co-conspirators are admissible and not considered impermissible hearsay. So communications between her, Alex Cox, other co-conspirators, including Chad Daybell, are relevant and admissible and allowed before the jury. Anyone who is not a co-conspirator, their statements aren't being offered for the truth of the matter asserted. They're simply being offered to provide context as to what the defendant's response was. It goes directly to motive, intent, that there's absence of any mistake on this issue and therefore are highly probative and relevant. All right. And could you, I, I know I've already asked this, but could you again explain to me how these tie into 29, not, not a sub, but just the Exhibit 29? Exhibit 29 was the certified business record. And at the beginning of the case, the defense agreed with the state that we, if we admitted the certification of the business records, um, that the state could produce various portions of those records rather than the record in entirety. We recognize that the rule typically requires that you admit the entire record with the certification, but because of the volume of documents in, that we've offered, we admitted select portions by agreement. These are the actual entirety of those business records. So in some respects, 29 as to Lori for style and 29 as to Lolly time are more complete than any of the other business records we've done because it's the entirety of those records. And you're, so the court has before it the certification and the agreement was that the underlying records came in and in fact have been used with multiple other witnesses, but not in their entirety without objection. Nate Duncan, um, Detective Hermosillo, referenced by Detective Pillar. So these records have been in, referenced by multiple individuals, and now the state is providing the entirety of both business record sets to the court. All right, thanks for the explanation, Ms. Smith. So the court's considered the objection of the defense on 29C and D. The court's also considered previous ruling allowing for the admission of Exhibit 29, uh, the court will overrule the objection as it relates to um, the hearsay objection 
finding that because these are the accounts of the defendant and the statements therein made by the defendant would not be subject to a hearsay exclusion and those other statements in there as noted by the state would not be subject to hearsay also as they are not being offered for the truth of the matter asserted also that there's been a uh, I think a, essentially a waiver of further objection where the information contained in 29 C and D uh, where 29 was already admitted and multiple witnesses have already testified to information contained within 29 C and D is the entirety of that information from where that other testimony came from that it would be appropriate to allow 29 C and D which is the complete version of the records to be admitted so for that reason exhibits 29 C and D uh, will be admitted and finally also finding that this witness laid an adequate foundation upon identifying those thumb drives so exhibits 29 C and D are admitted thank you your honor and uh, we appreciate that and we would ask the court require that the state or that the court provide us with copies of 29 C and D so that we can review those so that they are do accurately reflect what they what is purported to be on those we, we don't have time to go through uh, 100,000 pages of, of documents right now but we would ask the court to give us this weekend to do that okay if they're obviously electronic copies I believe can be pro provided to the defense if they haven't already been provided and those those need to be provided to the defense before the state rests so um, would it be acceptable if we just tell them where in the discovery it is located because it it takes a long time to cut copy these and they already have it at, at least once if not twice in discovery happy to, to show them where to find it okay. your honor I, i'm sorry may i speak go ahead my concern is is that they're going to introduce something that we may or may not have or may or may not be able to access i would like the court if it's possible to make copies of that and give it to us because i want to know exactly what's on that jump drive specifically that's admitted into this court for the jury to, to view all right, well, the court doesn't create exhibits, so uh, the exhibits are admitted that I will allow the defense an opportunity with the state to monitor also to simply produce copies of the electronic file that's on each of those jump drives. Okay. And as I understand it, each jump drive contains a single file, but it's a huge file of electronic information. It, it, it contains it in single, a single record, um, and that record will, of course, that's an iCloud has hundreds of technical um, technically different things but they're all part of the one record okay we can't pull out the chats versus the SMS versus the videos versus the MMS it, we would have a hundred thousand thumb drives so it's the entirety of Lolly time it's the entirety of Lori for styles okay well C and D are admitted and again the defense will be entitled to a electronic reproduction of C and D to be provided to them which I would think is just a matter of um, copying the file over to a new thumb drive that's the same size and giving them that but the state can observe when uh, that copying is made through the court's official exhibit thank you yes sir thank you judge all right do you want to continue then miss Smith yes judge and just so that there's clarification mr. wood is going to aid me um, in working with 29 C and D so he will be over here if that's acceptable to the court getting that up and going so people don't wonder what he's doing okay if he's there with technical assistance that will be fine thank you judge and I'm, I'm sorry to take things a bit out of order agent but I just wanted to get that done um, sooner rather than later I, you had indicated let's back up just a little bit did you have any other responsibilities while you were the supervisory agent in Boise for coordinating with um, organizations say on behalf behavioral analysis yes I did okay what is behavioral analysis the FBI has a, a highly specialized unit called the behavioral analysis unit they're sometimes referred to as the profilers that's a unit that exists in uh, Quantico Virginia um, it's comprised of actually five different sections um, crimes against adults crimes against children terrorism cyber and counterintelligence as well as training and research each division or state uh, in the United States has a BAU coordinator BAU behavioral unit behavioral analysis unit coordinator um, 
that individual is responsible for getting additional training in behavioral analysis and acts as a conduit when a state or local entity needs consultation services. Uh, the behavioral, the BAU coordinator um, does a triage of those cases and helps facilitate um, which cases are appropriate for the behavioral analysis unit to look at. I was the BAU coordinator for the state of Idaho for approximately 13 years. Okay. So are you a profiler yourself? I am not a profiler, but I have attended a number of trainings and conferences and, and have uh, read a lot of material as it relates to behavioral analysis in criminal investigations. And in that role, your job was to help facilitate and move um, a particular case through the process of getting a behavioral analysis where it was appropriate. Yes. Okay. Now, turning back to um, your work and um, assistance into the investigation of missing or abducted children, um, you indicated that there is a, a need for rapid deployment, and you talked about going within 24 hours. Is there a specialized unit within the FBI that handles child abduction cases on a rapid basis? Yes. What is that unit? So we have um, a team called the CARD team that stands for the Child Abduction Rapid Deployment Team. They've been in existence for over 20 years. They're essentially what we call a fly team. Uh, they are uh, specially trained agents that are located all over the country and when the child abduction takes place, they are deployable very quickly uh, to bring their expertise to, to bear uh, when a child goes missing. Um, is there sort of a time limit and when you can bring in that rapid deployment team? Well, their purpose um, in the immediate aftermath of a known abduction, their purpose is to respond. They, they don't take over the case, they're consultants. And so they come and they, they help the investigators ensure that um, all of the appropriate steps are being taken. Um, collectively, the Child Abduction Rapid Deployment Unit has responded to over 160 child abductions in the United States in the past 20 plus years. They are the world's foremost experts in those types of cases. And so in this particular investigation into the disappearance of J.J. Vallow and, and or Tylee Ryan, were you able to work with local law enforcement on where those two children were? Yes. And um, how did that happen? Um, the Rexburg Police Department uh, conducted a welfare check for J.J. Vallow, and subsequent to that welfare check, the very next day, they contacted the FBI um, in Pocatello, who then called me. And so my involvement in the case started uh, on November 27th of 2019. Okay. And did you partner with, with the Rexburg Police Department in looking for J.J. Vallow? Absolutely. And then ultimately uh, looking for Tylee Ryan? Yes. Okay. And as a part of that partnership with the Rexburg Police Department, um, did the FBI request the assistance or um, ask the, the CARD team, the rapid deployment team, to respond? We consulted with both the behavioral analysis unit and the card team. We did not ask for a card team deployment. Why not? Um, we knew very quickly that Lori Vallow had lied to the Rexburg Police Department when they responded to do the welfare check. And within a short period of time, we're able to ascertain uh, approximately how long uh, JJ and Tylee had been missing. And due to the span of time that had taken place, um, it, it it didn't fall under the parameters of a card deployment for those things that are done in the very immediate aftermath of a child going missing. So we spoke with them, we obtained their uh, advice, uh, but we did not ask for a deployment. 
And so um, you've indicated that you didn't ask for the deployment, but you also consulted with them and behavioral analysis? Yes. Why would you consult with behavioral analysis in this situation? Because of their experience in a, a wide variety of cases. And so they have um, background and expertise that your average uh, agent does not possess. And so when you have a complex, uh, complicated case, we consult with them to try to get the best advice to help us as we proceed forward with the investigation. So when you say get the best advice, does that mean helping you analyze evidence and assess and maybe reach conclusions? No, um, the behavioral analysis unit would give advice, for instance, if we had a critical interview, we might talk to them about that subject and, and get some strategies that they may suggest for the most effective interview techniques. But um, in, in this instance, and they, they can uh, provide an analysis of their own, um, but in this instance, most of the analysis in this case was done in-house by us here. Okay. And when you say in-house by us here, when you say analysis, what does that mean? Well, an analysis simply means looking at and reviewing um, various types of records and data. Uh, there's a vast spectrum of information that's valuable to us in these investigations from um, business records, cell phone records, iCloud records, um, so on and so forth, uh, video records. We review all of those things to look for evidence relevant to the case. And so when you say evidence, that means common ideas, investigative leads, themes or theories that the investigators need to follow up on? Um, yes and no. How yes and how no? So yes, in the, in the sense that when we are trying to determine a motive for a crime, there may be a theme that is relevant that gives us an indication as to why an individual may have committed a crime. No, in the sense that we are fact finders. And so our job is to um, investigate thoroughly and carefully and completely uh, in an effort to solve uh, the crime and develop evidence of who committed that crime. And in that sense, we aren't driven by a theme or a concept. We're driven by evidence. We follow the evidence that we find. You follow the evidence where it goes? Yes. And if it's centered around a particular subject, you follow that subject wherever it goes? Correct. Okay. Now, um, specifically in the investigation um, into the disappearance and sadly, ultimately, the, the murder of J.J. Vallow and Tyler Ryan and the murder of Tyler uh, of no, I'm going to object to argumentative. Sustain. Specifically in your review of the investigation, into the disappearance of J.J. Vallow and Tylee Ryan and the death of Tammy Daybell, what were your particular roles? I had two primary roles in this case. My first role was as the supervisor over this investigation. Um, our Pocatello office is quite small. We had three agents assigned when this uh, um, when we were contacted by the Rexburg Police Department, very quickly, two of those agents uh, transferred for one, well, one transferred, one retired. So we were down to one agent. Um, I supervised the activity of those people. When resources were needed, such as our evidence response team, um, or uh, forensic accountants, or analysts, or uh, when leads needed to be set, to other divisions, all of those things fall under my purview. And so um, I had the responsibility for the FBI oversight of this investigation. Um, that's In why partnership with your local partners? Correct. Okay. And so when you say your responsibilities, um, just to make sure I'm clear, the, the resources of the FBI and what resources the FBI would contribute to that partnership were directed by you? Correct. Okay. And you mentioned, and I think I accidentally cut you off, you mentioned crime analyst? 
We had an analyst assigned to this case, yes. Okay. And what does a crime analyst do? Their job is to look at records and to try to determine if there is relevant evidence in existence, for instance, phone analysis and analysis of Google accounts or other things. There's so much information in all of those records, and generally speaking, only a small portion of that may be relevant to the alleged crimes that we're investigating. And so you were talking about your role as sort of supervisory role. You said you had two roles. What was your second role on this case? My primary role was as an investigator in this case. I live in Boise. I work in Boise, but I traveled multiple times per month to Rexburg due to the complexity of this case, due to the fact that two children were missing. I felt that it was important for me to play an active role, given my background and experience in these types of cases. And so I, more so than my supervisory role, I played an investigative role in this case. I was present during the crime scene search where we located... I'm going to object to this. The narrative, there's no questions here. Sustained. And so you played an active role. Not only were you a supervisor, you played an active role as an investigator in this joint investigation. Yes. For all intents and purposes, I was the FBI case agent for this investigation. And so what specific work did you do as an investigator on this case? I conducted a number of interviews of witnesses. I was present at the search warrant execution on June 9th and 10th. My biggest investigative role was to undertake a complete analysis of the content of two iCloud accounts that were registered to Lori Vallow. The first is called Lori for Style at iCloud.com, and the second is called Lolly Time at iCloud.com. And those were... Why was it important that those accounts be examined? Because of the value of the information that's contained in those cloud storage. When you say the value, can you help us understand why such accounts would be valuable to investigators in this situation? Sure. The iCloud is simply the storage or backup for your Apple iPhone usage. Our phones are not phones anymore. They're phones, they're email accounts, they're our cameras, they contain photos and videos. We have text messaging, we have multimedia messaging. All of those things are stored in the iCloud. And so in this instance, we have a large volume of direct communications between Lori Vallow and others in this case. We have a number of photographs and videos and emails and contacts and notes that are all relevant to this case that were discovered during the review and analysis of the iCloud account. And that information was shared across departments and across agencies by multiple investigators, correct? That's correct. We had access to these iCloud accounts fairly early on in the investigation and they played an important role in our ultimate conclusion of what took place in the case. And so as you shared this information, did it lead the law enforcement partnership to execute a search warrant on the Daybell property on June 9th and 10th of 
2019. Yes, it did. Oh, 2020, I think I misspoke. 2020. Okay. Um, and you explained you were physically present? Yes, I was there. Again, in a dual role, I was the FBI supervisor on scene for that search, but I also participated uh, as an investigator throughout the two full days that the search was executed. Okay. And so, um, can you tell us about your personal activity at the Daybell residence on June 9th and 10th of 2020? Yes. Um, our evidence response team was present to... Um, oversee the search, but due to the size of the property, uh, other agents and investigators that are not formally part of the evidence response team were asked to help and to participate. The first step that uh, took place was essentially walking the property, uh, looking for evidence uh, that might exist within the property. Um, and did you personally walk the property um, looking for evidence? I did. Okay. What was the next step taken after um, officers and agents working together to search that property? Well, during the walk of the property, you're, you're looking for places on the property that might contain evidence. So during the walk of the property, myself and an agent who was uh, at my side um, located JJ's grave. Um, can you explain to us the process you use to locate JJ's grave? Yes. Um, a clandestine grave, there are certain telltale signs that you want to uh, find. Primarily, you're looking for aberrations in the earth. Uh, if a grave has been dug, typically the vegetation around where the digging took place is slightly different than the vegetation that's been undisturbed around that grave. Similarly, you will see sometimes a mound of earth where the grave has been dug, and sometimes you'll see a depression in the earth. Um, in, in this instance, uh, I was able to observe a slight change in the vegetation where JJ was buried, and then upon closer inspection, uh, I was able to see that there was essentially a seam around the grave where uh, the sod had been cut uh, and then replaced. And so you could feel with your hands that there was the, the outline of where the grave had been dug was present there. So when you say feel with your hands, did, did you actually feel the ground yourself? I did. Okay. Um, and, and that area was photographed, correct? Yes. Okay. Your Honor, um, the state uh, requests that just so that the witness um, looks at these again, uh, that the witness be handed state's already admitted Exhibit 170C, 170D, 170E, and 170H. Sir, would you take a look at those, please? Okay. Okay. Um, these have previously been admitted, but do you recognize those? I do. Um, and just so the record's clear, it may have been a little bit since the jury's seen those. What are they? Um, these are photographs that were uh, taken of the spot that I identified um, near the tree on the corner of the Daybell property where JJ was, JJ's remains were ultimately located. Okay. 
Um, Your Honor, I'd request permission to dis, um, publish or republish the state's exhibits 170 in the various numbers um, and use them during this witness's testimony. Any objection? No, Your Honor. All right, they can be published. <laughs> So you indicated a discussion on a change of vegetation. I, I would like you to chat with us if you see that in States Exhibit 170C. And let me zoom out. Yes, so this is a, a far away view. The subsequent photographs will, will be a little more telling, but essentially you can see right here this little spot. Um, if you look at the greenery that surrounds this spot and you can see some yellowing and it's just, unless you knew what you were looking for, you might not notice it, but that's, this is JJ's grave. You previously talked about signs of a, a tell, of uh, signs of a clandestine grave. Is that one sign of a clandestine grave? It is. Okay. Were there particular pieces of evidence that took you to that area of property? Yes. What were those pieces of evidence that took you and the other agent to that area of the property? We searched the entire property, but we knew that on uh, September 23rd of 2019 that Alex Cox's cell phone had been located in that area for a period of time. So going to that area, you saw that area and that sort of yellowing, and you said there's another picture that perhaps shows it better? Yes. Okay. Let me show you State's Exhibit 170D. Is that the better view of, of what you were talking about? Yes, this is a close-up view. And so you can see the vegetation here is, is fairly long and lush, but you have this slight area here where the vegetation simply isn't growing as well. And you can see a defined outline. You can even see some edges here. Um, and so that, that ultimately um, ended up being where JJ's remains were found. And you indicated that you felt the ground um, in this area. Is that the area that you felt the ground in? Yes, I felt the ground with with my hands, but I also had, uh, we carry a probe with you, which is essentially just a, a rod with a point on it uh, to be able to, if you find an area that you suspect may be something you want to examine further, you use that probe to uh, determine if, if hard, undisturbed ground exists, that probe doesn't really go in. If you've dug the earth up, uh, the probe usually goes in considerably easier. And were you carrying one of those probes? I was. Okay, and you put the probe in the ground in this area? I attempted to. Okay. Let me show you States Exhibit 170E. Is that one of the areas where you attempted to put the probe in the ground? Yes, that's just an even closer up shot that essentially shows the seam or one of the, if we look at it as a rectangle, it's just one of the seams that existed um, where the sod had been cut up. And when you say the seam, and I apologize, I may not have asked you, so forgive me. Turning back to States Exhibit 170D, can you outline that seam again, that, that area, that rectangle you were talking about? Certainly. So this would be the top right here. You can see that line there. You follow it down here. There's the bottom. And then here's the other side. So this is your rectangle. Okay. And so when you um, located that, um, was that area approximately how big or do you know? It's quite small. The seams on either end are probably 
18 to 24 inches, and then the length would be approximately 48 inches. Okay. Child size? Yes. Okay. And so you said you attempted to put the probe in. What, what do you mean by that? I mean the probe wouldn't penetrate the earth. Okay. Well, if that's a sign of a clandestine grave, why did you continue to look there? I'm sorry. If I, I thought you said earlier that a sign of clandestine grave was that you stick the probe in and the ground is loose, but if it's hard, it may not be. What what caused you to look further when the probe didn't go all the way in? Well, there the probe is just one simple tool that we use, um, and ultimately we understood why the probe didn't go in once we lifted the sod away we saw that a board some boards and rocks had been placed on top of jj's body and so my probe was hitting those rocks and boards okay and so that would be as what was reflected in states exhibit 170h correct so this is a photograph of that spot that we've been looking at um, and this shows where we have you can see where the uh, roots and vegetation from the tree have been cut uh, to prepare the grave. And uh, then these rocks, and then this is uh, one of two different boards that were present um, on top of JJ's body. Okay. And so um, th was the dirt on top of those rocks and boards seemingly loose or mounded in any way? It was very, very shallow, so there wasn't a lot of dirt on top of these rocks. It was, I mean, as soon as we took the sod up, we could see that there were rocks placed there. This photograph shows the dirt having been removed from between the rocks uh, as, as that grave was carefully and methodically exhumed. So this shows a couple of steps in where the sod's been taken away and um, the, the rocks uh, had been placed on top of boards. Once we removed the rocks and the boards, uh, we began to uh, see that uh, something was buried there. Okay. And ultimately, that's where J.J. Vela was discovered. Correct. Now, um, we're, we're done with pictures for a while, so thank you, ma'am. Um, you were present when JJ was discovered, but other officers um, took over and, and helped exhume JJ's body, correct? I was there through the entirety of that process. Uh, I helped uh, exhume the grave and exhume the body, uh, as well as helping uh, to exhume Tylee's remains. Okay. Um, multiple officers had to do those things, correct? Yes, there was a, it's a large property and there were several members of our evidence response team along with detectives from the Rexburg Police Department, uh, the Fremont County Sheriff's Office, and other FBI employees. And because of the, the way those bodies were, multiple officers were involved in um, helping recover those remains. Yes, that's correct. Okay. Um, so turning to uh, your other sort of work as an investigator on this, you discussed your work in reviewing and the value of looking at the iCloud accounts of Lori Vallow. Yes. Okay. Um, now, how much experience do you have in analyzing such data in relation to the other facts in the investigations to help determine sort of the facts and circumstances or motives of a particular crime or suspect? I have uh, several years worth of experience. Um, the FBI specializes in long-term complex investigations and those investigations involve uh, in most cases the analysis of voluminous amounts of records and so as an investigator, as a case agent, I've participated uh, in the analysis of those records of of records in investigations uh, for the entirety of my career okay. and um, you personally have worked with Apple iCloud accounts and records I have 
and you've talked about sort of the value of them overall to law enforcement, but in iCloud accounts, um, what specific types of data are in those iCloud accounts? Essentially, whatever is on your smartphone is in the iCloud. It's simply a mirror, uh, more than a mirror. It, it's a it's a storage device of of the activity of your phone. So it contains your contacts, it contains your call logs, it contains your cookies, it contains what we call carved strings, which is data that's been deleted but hasn't yet been overridden. Uh, it contains SMS or text messages. It contains MMS or multimedia messages. It contains images, videos, uh, and the list goes on and on. And so um, all of these things are present in the iCloud. And forgive me, I heard you talk about lots of the multimedia, the pictures, the location data, the text. Does it also sometimes include things that somebody has tried to delete from their phone? Yes. In uh, what way is that captured? In a couple of ways. So you can delete something from your phone to um, increase the storage on your phone. But if your phone is backed up to the cloud, uh, typically it, it's no longer present on your phone, but it still exists in the cloud. So you can have data on your phone that you've deleted that data still exists. It still is present on your iCloud. Okay. And what's a carved string? So carved strings are, are data that has been deleted off of the iCloud, but not yet overridden. What does that mean? I'm not a super technical guy, um, but it's it's bits and pieces of messages or communications. Um, they don't make a whole lot of sense. Uh, the carved strings weren't really of any value to us in the investigation. I just mentioned that as a part of what exists on the iCloud. Okay. And what tools do you use to look at an iCloud? The tool we use is a software program called Cellbrite. Um, Cellbrite does not alter the data, it simply organizes it. So um, Cellbrite is, is a pretty user-friendly tool that will take the contents of the iCloud and put it in its various compartments, as I've mentioned, and then you can go in and view each of those separate um, places within the iCloud. And um, when you're using Cellbrite, does it um, allow you to look at the data but limit how much data you look at? Yes. So with each of the different sections of the iCloud, you can apply a filter. And so um, that was something that I did fairly frequently in my analysis of the Lori for Style account, not, not the Lolly Time, but I did use filters in Lori for style. So when you say filters, is a filter say sort of date range? Yes, you can you can use a filter that's particularly called capture time. So the Lori for style iCloud account, um, the earliest records date back to December of 2000. That's far beyond the scope of this investigation. And so the capture time filter that I used for the purposes of this case uh, was October of 2018, the month where Chad Daybell and Lori Vallow first met. And so I did some cursory review of earlier data uh, just to make sure I wasn't missing anything, but I focused my efforts on the date at which the, uh, the conspiracy that's charged could have began. Um, and what were those dates? Primarily, I would plug in October 26th of 2018, and then I would examine from that date forward. Okay. And why'd you pick that date? October 26th, 2018 is the date that Lori Vallow and Chad Daybell met at a Preparing a People conference in St. George, Utah. 
And so, and then you ended your filter when? On Lori for style. There, there was a point in time in late November of 2019 uh, when uh, Lori Vallow uh, stopped using her phones. And so the data in the iClouds stops when the phone usage stopped. And I can't recall the exact date. In It's November 2019 for sure towards the end of the month, but I can't recall the exact date. And what was the date that the um, law enforcement uh, approached Lori Vallow? Lori Vallow was approached on uh, November 26th of 2000. 19. Okay. And then, but some, the data on Lori for style stops sometime in, at the end of November, 2019. Correct. Um, Your Honor, the, the state intends at this time to display state's exhibit 29C in D. If, we're happy to keep proceeding, but if we want to take a quick morning break so defense counsel can just double check it now, understanding they want a copy, but I respect that they would like to see it. We can do that or we can proceed. Okay, let's go ahead and take our uh, mid morning break at this time then. I'll allow defense to access that. So uh, let's plan on starting up again no later than uh, 1030. All right. Thank you. Please be seated. Mr. Bailiff, if you'll please have the jurors return to the courtroom. Just as a, before the as the jury's coming in, can we approach sidebar real quick? Yes. Okay. All right. Sorry. I can do it here. It's just. Thank you, Mr. Bailiff. Please be seated. Uh, Ms. Smith, did you still want a sidebar? I, I, I can make the record here real quick. Um, it's my understanding that the defense counsel has been given a, their own um, duplicate copy of states 29C and D, which are the iCloud accounts of Lori Vallow. They were also disclosed in discovery um, in 2021, but they have a copy of the exhibit itself. That's my understanding. That's correct. Okay. Thank you, counsel. Okay. Thank you, judge. You can inquire. Thank you, judge. Good morning again. Morning. morning. 
Now, earlier you talked about reviewing the Lori Verstyle and the Lowry time accounts and viewing that data set through Cellbrite. Do you remember that? Yes. Okay. And you've previously recognized States Exhibit 29C and D, which are the Lowry time accounts. If you could look at your screen, Mr. Wood is loading it. It's taken just a minute. We need it. It's hooked up through the projector, the HDMI. Is your screen? So it'll be published on the. Yes, Judge. Very well. Okay. All right. Um, Agent Hart, what are we what are we looking at on the the projector? Um, it's displaying states twenty nine C and D, but what what view is it for the record? So this is the Cellbrite software. Essentially, what you're seeing here is the Lori for Style at iCloud dot com uh, iCloud account. Um, you can see Cellbrite up here. And then on the side where you see all of the different compartments, uh, different types of data that exists in the iCloud, with, with, with each of these types of data, cookies for instance, they, they will show the number of records that exist in the iCloud. So you have device locations, journeys, locations, emails, MMS messages, notes, and it goes on, SMS messages. I spent a substantial amount of time here, and you get an idea of the volume, uh, you know, over 13,000 text messages, um, voicemails, uh, images, so on and so forth. So this is what it looks like when you first, this is essentially the opening page of the Lori for style at iCloud.com and then Lolly time would be a mirror of this. It's just simply a different account. Can we show them the Lolly time page, please? Okay. And and that's pulling from the state's exhibit, correct? Yes. Okay. So this is the um, you can see it says Lolly time at iCloud.com um, and it has the same compartments as the other iCloud, you'll see that the number of records in Lolly time is substantially less than Lori for style. And that's because Lolly time uh, was created in April of 2019 and then goes through November of 2019. So this particular um, account um, is much smaller. Okay. So Lori for styles was much longer because it wasn't used for a longer time. Lori for style, the first, the earliest record in Lori for style is December of 2000. So uh, close to 19 years. Okay. And then Lolly time, I, I apologize. It started in what month? April of 2019. And it ceased to be used according Both, to what you could find? Correct. Both accounts ceased to be used in November of 2000, towards the end of November of 2019. Okay. Now in, um, Analyzing the records in states 29C and D, what process did you follow? A very methodical one. Um, I would go into each of these compartments, which also exist where it says logs contact. And as you scroll down, you'll see all of the different compartments. And so my process was to open up one of those um, compartments and then examine the data that was in there. If there was something that was pertinent or relevant, then I would uh, make a document of that. In um, Lori Vello's iCloud accounts, approximately how many records of data were there? I don't have an exact count and that, that gets to be a little bit difficult. For instance, there's a section for chats 
well, one chat may contain 3,000 messages within that chat, but my best estimate from kind of tallying these is between 130 and 150,000 records. And um, if we could just turn to, just so the jury can see one of those, let's um, look at Lori for style, the SMS section, if we could. Can we please identify which exhibit we're looking at? Um, yes, absolutely. Is this the Lori for style, states exhibit 29, I think it's D. Thank you. And turning to Lori for style um, in the SMS section, Let's look at line A place to share the things. Do you too? So, Agent, well, Mr. Wood helps locate that and display that. Is that the process you had to go through for looking? The process he's going through is that the process you had to go through to look at every one of these texts? Yes. So, in Lori for Style, I applied a date filter starting October 26th of 2018. When I applied that filter, there were approximately 4,500 text messages. And I started at that date and then read every single text message down to the, to the last. Okay. And that's just the text messages? Yes. And so I, I followed that same process for all of the various compartments that you can see that are displayed uh, on this uh, screen. So Ms. I want to make a clarification here. I think you may be looking at 29C, not D. Oh, I'm sorry. I apologize if I misspoke, Your Honor. Okay, thank you, Counsel. Yeah. Well, I think uh, we need to be clear if it is 29C or if it is 29D. If you could, yeah, let's confirm. This is Lori for style at iCloud.com. Twenty nine C. Okay. Is is that what the court shows? Yes. Okay, good. And so turning to line eighteen uh, forty two, is that what's displayed up there, Agent? Yes. Um could you show us um sort of how you would figure out what that record was and what it revealed? Certainly. So you can see a timestamp. Um, so it would show the date that this message was sent on March 20th of 2019. Uh, under the parties, it would show the owner, that's Lori Vallow, and it was sent to her brother, Alex Cox. And then under the body, it contains the text message that was sent. In this case, it says, I'm finding out some great stuff about you. I'm going to do some ceilings. Can't wait to share all the things I learned about you. Wow, you're going to like it. It explains a lot. And so when you looked at those texts, were you also aware of what was happening around um, in that case um, to determine whether a text is relevant? Absolutely. As I, I was a participant in this case in its totality from essentially day two. And so having that knowledge as the investigation progressed um, helped me to understand which text messages or other types of communications or records that might exist in the iClouds, uh, whether they were relevant or pertinent to the investigation. If they were, I would um, make a note of that and um, that's how I proceeded as far as my analysis is concerned. So when you were determining whether a particular 
Well, let me ask you, was every single text that Lori Vallow sent relevant to the investigation into what happened to J.J. Vallow, Tylee Ryan, and Tammy Daybell? Not at all. Okay. Why do you say that? Well, there were hundreds, thousands of texts between Lori Vallow and um, friends and associates between, uh, you know, car rental companies, hotels, insurance. Um, there was a lot of communications uh, regarding um, appointments and medications for JJ and things that Tylee was doing. So there was, there were the normal everyday type of communications that most individuals have. And so those, I examined those, but they certainly really didn't have any bearing on the case. Okay. So how did you determine what was relevant? Based on the investigation, the totality of the investigation, what we had uncovered from witness interviews um, and from the various searches and other efforts that we were engaging in, we uh, had developed a pretty good idea of uh, what may have occurred. And I was looking for communications that um, uh, were indicative of uh, of participation uh, in the disappearance of JJ, Tylee, and uh, Tammy Daybell. And when you started looking at the the records on the iCloud account, was it still actively a search for JJ and Tylee? When I began, yes, it was. Um, but I have looked at this over the course of, of several weeks and months and, and certainly reviewed it as the case has gone on. So the initial review started prior to the children being found uh, and, and that review um, continued. Even after they were recovered but not alive? Correct. And um, any idea how many hours it has taken you to go through all of these um, records? well over 200 hours. Okay. And so um, in, in those excess of 200 hours, in, did you also, as you were reviewing it, sort of find investigative leads or concepts that merited following up? Yes. What were some of those investigative leads or concepts that merited, merited following up? First and foremost, it was the relationship between Lori Vallow and Chad Daybell. Um, Why know, is that? Why right. is that relevant? Well, it was uh, apparent that they were uh, very quickly after meeting involved in an uh, illicit affair with one another and that they shared plans to um, be married and have a life together. Were there any other investigative leads or concepts that needed follow-up? Yes, as part of the plans between Chad Daybell and Lori Vallow, they had obstacles that were in the way of them uh, achieving. Your Honor, I don't object. This is argumentative. Sustained. Um, when you say they had, um, understand the, the court's ruling, so you, you identified leads that followed up. Um, did you find um, information or discussion that there were barriers to their um, efforts to be together? I'm going to object as to argumentative. The question is argumentative. Judge, it's an investigative process, and if it had significance to him, the jury is entitled to hear that, especially if it factored into his creation of a summary. It's overruled. Thank you, Judge. There were several communications regarding Tylee and J.J., um, that were relevant uh, to their deaths. Okay. How so? They discussed their deaths. Okay. And what did that have to do with the concept that they had, had begun an affair or planned a future together? After the affair began, there then began to be communications regarding the deaths of Charles Vallow, Tammy Daybell, J.J., Vallow and Tylee Ryan.
Okay. Any conversations about Tammy Dubell? Yes. Okay. And was, was there communication that um, law enforcement had to follow up on that suggested that those individuals were considered barriers to the, the uh, by the defendant to her future with Chad Daybell? I'm going to object this to argumentative judge. Overruled. The exact word they used in the communications was obstacles. Okay. And just to be clear, the communications between who? Chad Daybell and Lori Vallow. Okay. And they characterized J.J., Tylee, Tammy, Charles as obstacles. Correct. Okay. Your Honor, my object is this is misstates the uh, actual evidence. The evidence will be admitted shortly, Judge. I'm just laying a foundation for summary. Okay. Well, it's uh, at this point then without that being entered into yet, there's no foundation for those comments, so I'll sustain that objection. Okay. And so in um, following up and pursuing investigative leads and information within the iCloud accounts and in connection to interviews and other evidence, were there any other S inv um, investigative leads or information that merited following up? Yes, there was financial information that was deemed to be relevant. There was information regarding the relationship between Alex Cox, Lori Vallow's brother, uh, and Lori Vallow and Chad Daybell that were relevant. Okay. And um, was there, in terms of the financial information, why would that be relevant in analyzing the iCloud account in context of this investigation? Well, uh, during the course of the investigation, one of the elements that we examined was a potential financial motive for the crimes. And so that was part of our process in, uh, in being thorough as it relates to looking at all the information that was available to us as we uh, conducted the case. And in the review of the evidence of the case, in particular, the information contained in the iCloud accounts, was there um, information that suggested there was evidence of financial motive for these individuals? I'm going to object, Your Honor. That's argumentative. Overruled. Yes. Um, what evidence did you find that merited um, following up as an investigative uh, tool or investigative uh, avenue? In the iCloud specifically, there was uh, communications and direct references to uh, a large life insurance policy possessed by Charles Vallow, as well as uh, Social Security payments that were attributable, attributable to J.J. Vallow and Tylee Ryan. You also indicated that there was some investigative information sort of stemming or contributed to from Lori Vallow's iCloud account about a relationship between Alexander Cox, Chad Daybell, and Lori Vallow. Did I hear that correctly? Yes. Okay. What information or evidence did you hear that, that led to investigative pursuits? There were a number of communications between uh, Alex Cox and Lori Vallow that were deemed to be pertinent to the investigation. And it was clear that there was a uh, relationship between Alex Cox and Chad Daybell as well. Okay. And why would those things be relevant to the investigation and to what happened to JJ, Tylee, and Tammy? Those relationships were important because those individuals uh, throughout the course of the investigation, um, that's ultimately who was charged with the alleged crimes. Okay. Now, in using what is um, up on the screen, the, the iCloud account for Lori Vallow, for you know both Lori for Style and Raleigh Time, um, you had to go through sort of each one of these screens that we saw um, for about approximately 200 hours. Is that correct? Yes. Okay. So um, I, did you prepare a summary exhibit for use in explaining the findings and representing certain text um, to the jury? 
I did. Okay. Otherwise, we have to go line by line through the iCloud. That's correct. All right. And so in um, in preparing that, did you pick um, texts that were representative of investigative concepts or communications by the defendant? Yes, I chose those pieces of uh, data. So there are text messages, there are multimedia messages, there are videos, there are emails, there are notes, uh, and those things that I deemed to be pertinent, to be directly relevant to this case. Um, I would, in terms of preparing my summary, I would cut and paste directly from the iCloud and put it into a PowerPoint presentation. So that was my method, was to cut and paste exactly what is displayed in the iCloud account into the summary exhibit. Okay, can you just use the pointer again and show us what you would cut and paste, uh, just so that we're clear um, that you literally took from the iCloud and put it into your summary exhibit? Certainly, so again, there's a timestamp which shows a date and time, um, the parties, and then the communication. So I would note the date and the time, the parties, and then I would cut and paste. Uh, I, I didn't cut the specific phone numbers, I just noted the parties, but I would cut and paste in its entirety each message or piece of data. Okay, so you didn't hand type it, you no. cut and paste from the original into your summary? Correct. Okay, and um, that summary was prepared in anticipation of explaining your investigative findings to the jury? As an aid, yes. Okay, and um, that summary um, was an effort to uh, sort of show the representative ideas and evidence found in the iCloud? Correct. Okay, you're going to ask that the witness be handed States Exhibit 183, in 183A. A courtesy copy of which has been given defense counsel. Agent, did you get a chance to look at states 183 and 183A? Yes. What are they? Uh, this is, 183A is a hard copy of the PowerPoint presentation that I prepared for a summary exhibit. 183 is an electronic copy of that with my initials on the thumb drive. Okay, so you prepared that thumb drive? Yes. Okay. And 183A is a physical hard copy um, for use in court or by the jury? Correct. Okay. Um, I move for the admission of States Exhibit 183 and 183A. Any objection? Yes, Your Honor, we stated on the record prior to uh, or outside the presence of the jury what that, um, what that objection was. We just stand by that objection. All right, the court heard argument on an objection earlier this morning outside the presence of the jury. I made a ruling with no new uh, substance to the objection. The court will stand by its prior ruling and allow for the exhibits 183 and 183A to be admitted. Thank you, Your Honor. And you're under making sure the court has their courtesy copy of 183A, correct? Thank you. I do. Thank you. I request permission to display State's Exhibit 183A. You can publish it. Thank you. And actually, I think what you're publishing is 183, not A. 
I apologize. Yes. Thanks, Judge. You're welcome. Agent, if you could look at the screen, um, I see displayed uh, an initial uh, slide in States Exhibit 183. What are we seeing here? This is a line that I located in the contact section of Lori for Style at iCloud.com. And um, it was saved under the name of Bishop Shumway. It was created on October 28th, 2018. Uh, what stands out about this particular contact is that the telephone Objection, number... Your Honor, he's now giving a narrative exa explanation. Oh, uh, sustained. Okay. So um, what is it that it stands out about the slide we're looking at? What stands out is that the phone number 208-690-9374 is the known cellular telephone number for Chad Daybell. And what was the date this contact um, is reflected in the cell phone data or the iCloud account of Lori Vallow? It was created on October 28, 2018. Um, and just so that we're clear, that date had significance because why? Chad, and, Chad Daybell and Lori Vallow met at a Preparing a People conference in St. George, Utah, on October 26th, and that conference spanned the, the 26th, 27th, and 28th of October. Okay. Is this the first known electronic evidence of contact between Chad Daybell and Lori Vallow? It is. Okay. So turning to um, the next, which um, is labeled SMS section, Lori for Style at iCloud. Dot com. What are we seeing here? This is a text string uh, between Lori Vallow and Audrey Baratario that took place on January 23rd of 2019. Okay. If you could read to us the record, into the record, what that text string was. Yes. Line 2585. Hi, Audrey. This is Lori. I would love to talk to you sometime. Text me or call me. I'm excited to be able to talk to you about what we both know. Line 2584. Oh, hi, Lori. Guess you talked to Chad. Ha ha. Line 2580. Did he tell you I have a crazy work schedule? I might be able to talk tonight. I'll have to play it by ear, but it wouldn't until... ABT, 9.30 p.m. or after, the same for tomorrow. Line 2578, uh, Lori Vallow to Audrey Baratario. He did, that's okay. Just let me know when you are available. No pressure. I just think it's fun to talk to someone who knows what's really going on. Line 2576, reply from Audrey Baratario to Lori Vallow. So what times usually work for you? I usually talk to him on my lunch breaks in Mondays or Tuesdays, Sunday afternoons, I can talk. Agent, the question, my question is, this, this communication by the defendant with Audrey Baratario, um, what, if any, significance did it have to you? The, signif the significance that it had to me is the reference to what Lori Vallow and Audrey Baratario both knew. Why is that significant? It's significant because Chad Daybell had disclosed to Audrey Baratario his plans to marry Lori Vallow. Okay. And um, did, did it also indicate anything about a, an establishment of a friendship or a relationship between Audrey and Lori? Yes, Chad had told Audrey Baratario that his wife, Tammy Daybell, was going to die 
and that he and Lori were to be married, but he wanted Audrey to act as a buffer between uh, he and Lori uh, during the ensuing time period until Tammy Daybell died. And does it indicate that um, Audrey Bataria was going to engage in that friendship with Lori? Based on the text string, yes. Okay. Now, turning to an SMS text section in Lori for style at iCloud.com from March 20th, 2019. Can you explain to us what we're seeing here? These are some texts that took place on March 20th of 2019 between Lori Vallow and Alex Cox. Could you read those into the record, please? Line 1842 from Lori Vallow to Alex Cox. I'm finding out some great stuff about you. I'm gonna go do some ceilings. Can't wait to share all the things I learned about you. Wow, you're gonna like it. It explains a lot. Line 1840, text from Alex Cox to Lori Vallow. Okay, hurry up please. Line 1837, uh, reply text from Lori Vallow to Alex Cox. I'm going to check everything with my source tonight to make sure I got this all right, but it's really good. We can talk about it tomorrow, hopefully. Uh, Agent, why did you include uh, this in your summary? During the course of the investigation, it became uh, apparent that um, Chad Daybell acted as a quasi-religious leader and that Alex Cox was involved in the alleged conspiracy as it related uh, to the deaths of the children and Tammy Daybell. And this is an instance where Lori Vallow is communicating to her brother, Alex Cox, regarding the things that she is learning about him. The reference to going to check with my source tonight, I believe is a reference to Chad Daybell. Objection calls for speculation. That's overruled, but obviously you can go into that on cross. Very good, problems. thank you. Um, now, looking at this text, you indicated that Chad became a quasi-leader. Was there evidence to suggest why Lori Vallow would be communicating that to Alex Cox rather than just Chad? There were occasions where Lori Vallow made direct um, communications uh, regarding religious matters or religious concepts, but it was frequent and repetitive that Alex Cox, Melanie Boudreau, others would solicit Lori to check or inquire with Chad Daybell and then would uh, return answers back to those individuals. In context of the evidence from the iCloud and the other evidence in totality of the case, um, was there evidence on Lori Vallow's sort of position power with regard to those people in religious concepts? Yes. What was that position power and what evidence was there of that? Her position was um, right next to Chad Daybell. Uh, the two of them were in an elevated position and others would seek their counsel and advice as it related to alleged revelations and visions and so forth. In, in seeking that counsel or information, was there any evidence at times that Alex Cox or others would seek direc direction or instruction from Lori Vallow? Yes. And is that reflected in some of the text in, um, that you've provided in summary? It is. Was it pro pro is it reflected throughout both iCloud um, accounts um, and the overall account of Lori Vallow? Yes, it is. Now, turning towards an SMS text from Lori for in Lori for Style at iCloud.com, 
Can you tell us what we're looking at, um, you know, from line 1763 through 1761? This is another short uh, text string between Alex Cox and Lori Vallow that took place on March 26th of 2019. Okay. Um, and could you read those lines into the record, please? Yes. Line 1763, text from Alex Cox to Lori Vallow. Correct. Charles's body is alive. Line 1762 from Alex Cox to Lori Vallow. What did you learn? Line 1761 from Lori Vallow to Alex Cox. A lot. Still working on it. We'll call you later. Why was this series of the SMS um, included in your summary? These short texts uh, actually contain a lot of information regarding what was taking place in the investigation. How so? Chad Daybell had identified uh, Charles Vallow as somebody who was a dark entity whose body had been possessed by any number of spirits, uh, which were named with various names. And so this first text, when Alex Cox is uh, reaching out to Lori Vallow, he's, he's affirming that Charles Vallow's body his physical body is still alive and inquiring what Lori Vallow had learned about that, which she replied she had learned a lot and would contact him later. Okay. And so um, the learned a lot, what does still working on it mean in context of the iCloud account and the overall investigation? We see or I saw very frequent usage of that particular term. Uh, we are working uh, on things, and that is a direct reference to this um, belief that they were uh, in a, a battle uh, against zombies and dark entities, and so when they would talk about working on something, they were making a reference to their efforts you know, related object. to this that. Is this is misstating the evidence that's actually been put in. I think it's beyond the scope of what's been entered, so I'll sustain that. Okay. Um, when you say they said working on it, was it often Lori Vallow herself saying working on it? Yes. Okay. And in your review of the text section and the MMS and the various iCloud accounts reflecting Lori Vallow's um, statements or state of mind, um, did you see evidence that her brother believed what she was saying? Frequently. Okay. Did you see evidence reflected um, that would show that um, Alex Cox was seeking input or direction from his sister with regard to the various potential bad spirits or people's physical body? Yes. Turning to the SMS section of longlytime at iCloud.com, um, and I see a group of texts um, from July 9th of 2019. Is that is that accurate? Yes. Okay. And I noticed that each of these slides have appeared chronological. And I, forgive me if I didn't ask, in preparing your summary, how did you put the various text into your summary? I did that chronologically. So during in, in the summary, you'll see we may move back and forth between Lori for style at iCloud.com and Lolly time at iCloud.com. Uh, for the most part, it's Lori for style in the beginning and the ending of this summary exhibit, and, and most of the middle of it is taken from Lolly time at iCloud.com. But I placed all of the data chronologically. Why? I think that that paints the most accurate picture of what was taking place as it relates to the communications. If you separate them out into various sections, then it becomes very fragmented. And I believe that chronologically, I mean, it, these events took place chronologically, so it made sense to arrange the exhibit chronologically. Okay. 
And so um, we're seeing a text communication um, July 9th, 2019, uh, between Lori Vallow and Melanie Butchero. Is that correct? Yes. Could you read those into the record, please? Yes. Line 3135 from Lori Vallow to Melanie Boudreau. They have an elaborate plan. I'll call you soon. Line 3134 from Melanie Boudreau to Lori Vallow. I could take all the babies with and drive and take our stuff. Line 3133 from Lori Vallow to Melanie Boudreau. You can't go at all. We both need to stay here to defend ourselves. Line 3132 from Lori Vallow to Melanie Boudreau. It's coming to a head. This week will change everything. Okay. Why did you include that particular series of text um, from Lori Vallow in your summary? Yeah, the only way you can answer that is through hearsay evidence. I'll sustain that objection. I, I'm sorry, Your Honor. I, I, I guess I don't understand the objection. Your Honor, would the court like me to clarify? Like yeah, may we approach sidebar? Because I, I, really, I really don't understand. Well, I'd like to have the question reread, please. Okay. All right, upon rehearing the question, I misheard that. I'll overrule that objection. Thank Apologies. you. Thank you. Do, did you hear the question? Do I have it repeated? I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, the timeline in this case is important. So this text string took place in the evening of July 9th, 2019, which is approximately 36 hours uh, before uh, Charles Vallow was killed. These texts are a reference uh, to um, events surrounding that. Okay. And, and again, Judge, I'm gonna object just for the record that the only way he could have gotten that information was specifically to Melanie Boudreau is through hearsay evidence from Melanie Boudreau. All right, well, he's testified it's through information obtained through these iCloud accounts. So for that, I'll, and because they've been admitted, I'll overrule the objection. Thank you. All right. And so the timing of this uh, communication by Lily Vallow was significant to you in relation to the death of Charles Vallow? Correct. Okay. And in the text, it was a text from Lily Vallow, in her own words, it's coming to a head. This week will change everything. Yes. Okay. <laughs> And when, you, when um, in context of the investigation and the overall um, review of the iCloud, what does it's coming to a head mean um, to you? It's a reference to the marriage between uh, Charles Vallow and Lori Vallow, uh, their marriage from, from the communications and the totality of the investigation had deteriorated uh, substantially and I'll, I'll object to speculation that, that she's calling for him to speculate as to what these texts mean I'll sustain that okay. and ask to strike that from the record all right the final part of that answer will be stricken from the record based on the objection the jury's instructed not to please consider that particular response so um in, in your review of the evidence in your review of the iCloud did you learn from the defendant's own words that her marriage to Charles Vallow was deteriorated? Yes. Okay. In fact, I believe you early talked about that she characterized Charles Vallow as an obstacle. Is that Objection, correct? That's argumentative, Judge. Overruled. It was actually Chad Daybell who used the phrase obstacles relating uh, or um uh, connect in in connection with um these individuals okay and so it's coming to a head um that statement from the defendant um was there evidence within the iCloud uh, that you reviewed the defendant's own words that reflected whether or not she wanted charles Vallow out of her life as her husband 
Yes. Okay. Let's turn to some additional uh, text from early time on July 9th, 2019, reflected in the next slide. Could you please um, look at lines 3120 and 3072? Do you see those? I do. Could you read those into the record, please? Yes. Line 3120 from Lori Vallow to Alex Cox, getting sleepy, so I'm going to need you to stay close to me the next couple days. Mel, too. She can't go to Utah. They are planking some kind of intervention, but want Mel out of the way, so I'm left alone. I need to come get the stuff at your house tomorrow and secure it. Lots to do. Thank you for standing by me. It's all coming to a head this week. I will be like Nephi, I am told, and so will you. Line 3072, text from Lori Vallow to Melanie Boudreau. Al is here. Charles says he will come over in the morning. Why did you include this particular, um, these particular texts from Lori Vallow to Alex Cox and Melanie Boudreau in your summary? Your Honor, I'll object that these text things out of context. He specifically stated that he is going in uh, line by line, and it looks like there's almost uh, almost a hundred uh, lines between these two texts. Um, I'll overrule the objection, and I think it's appropriate for cross examination. Very good, thank you. I'm, I'm sorry. The question was, um, why did you include these particular? Um, text communications from Lori Vallow to Alex Cox and Melanie Boudreau in your summary. During the course of the investigation, we found out that Adam Cox, another brother of Lori Vallow, had flown in uh, in conjunction with Charles Vallow to try to approach Lori regarding the things that were taking place. Um, and, and so that's why I included these communications. Okay. And um, turning to line 3120, I will be like Nephi, I am told, and so will you. Um, in your review of the evidence and your research on the items of relevance in the iCloud account, what is Nephi? Nephi is the name of an ancient prophet whose life is um, documented or chronicled in a book of scripture called the Book of Mormon. And so um, he is one of the, that, that book of scripture spans from 600 BC to roughly 400 AD. And Nephi is one of the first uh, prophets that is. Um, documented in that particular book. Okay. And um, the phrase, I will be like Nephi, um, other than a, an ancient prophet, is was there significance to the investigation that merited review in the use of the word Nephi as applied to Lori Vallow and Alex Cox? Objection. Calls for speculation. She, he's already indicated that Nephi is found throughout the Book of Mormon, which is, which is hundreds of pages long. I'll sustain the objection. Thank you. Um, in terms of Lori's use and her own words identifying herself as Nephi, what were the situations involving Nephi that were relevant to the investigations? Objection calls for speculation. I think there need to be some additional foundation. Uh, you're going to go into that term and what it means in the context of these communications. Okay. So in terms of uh, foundation, are you aware of um, historical um, attributes or um, story significance to the prophet Nephi? I am. Okay. Um, what were the historic accounts related to the prophet Nephi? Okay, objection vague. There are hundreds of stories about Nephi. That's overruled. Thank you. The witness knows the witness can answer. The primary one relates to an incident where Nephi was commanded by God to slay an individual named Laban. Your Honor, I'm going to object as this is speculative. Overruled. I'm sorry, you can keep going. You said it was about Nephi was commanded to slay Laban. 
Yes. And um, what was the rest of that particular historic accounting of the prophet Nephi? Simply put, Laban was in possession of records that Nephi and his family wanted to possess before they left Jerusalem. And Nephi was commanded by God to slay Laban to obtain those records. Okay. And so Laban, kill it. was Laban considered a, a good guy or a bad guy? Bad guy. Okay. And your, based on his response to the question, I believe it's irrelevant. And it, it, it specifically doesn't have anything to do with uh, the crime that's charged here, and it doesn't have, it doesn't even correlate. Well, there's a reference to the term in the text, and I'll allow a little more on this, but it's getting outside the scope of, I think, what's relevant pretty quick here, Ms. Smith. The defendant herself likened herself to Nephi, correct? Yes. And the defendant likened, likened Alex Cox to Nephi, correct? Yes. Okay. Um, and in, if I understand correctly, um, Nephi was commanded to kill Laban. That's correct. I'm going to object as to vague. Nephi was commanded to do lots of things. Overruled. Um, and so, and the date that the defendant likens herself to Nephi um, was July 9th, 2019? Yes. She also told Alex he was like Nephi, correct? Yes. Okay. And in the text communication from Lori Vallow to Melanie Boudreau, um, did Lori Vallow indicate on July 10th, 2019, that Alex Cox was with her? Yes. Okay. Now, Defense counsel pointed out, and we're going to chat about this in a minute, I noticed that there's a line number and a date, and then it appears to have a different line number and a different date in your summary. Why didn't you include every text between those two? If I included every text between the two accounts, we would be at well over 8,000 text messages. And so... Um, I chose those texts that I felt were in context and were relevant, um, but oftentimes there would be three or four people texting with Lori Vallow at the same time, and some of those texts in between have no relevance whatsoever to this case. Other texts were very redundant. Um, we see the same type of communication over and over and over again, uh, and so I chose those text messages that I believed were relevant to this case and was cautious not to um, prepare this summary exhibit where I'm taking things out of context. Okay. And um, if you included every text, it really wouldn't be a summary, would it? No, it wouldn't. Okay. Now, um, turning towards some chats that were in Lori for style, um, can you tell us what we're seeing next on slide seven? Yes, this is so a, a chat in the uh, iCloud account um, generally was amongst multiple individuals and the chat would contain numerous or could contain numerous texts. Um, this is a, a chat between Lori Vallow, Cole Vallow and Zach Vallow. Uh, Cole Vallow and Zach Vallow are Charles Vallow's sons. Okay. And this is communication from Roy Vallow in that chat? Correct. Okay. Could you please read into the records the communications that Roy Vallow had and um, to whom? Certainly. So uh, July 12th, 2019. Hi, boys. I have very sad news. Your dad passed away yesterday. I'm working on making arrangements, and I'll keep you informed with what's going on. I'm still not sure how to handle things. Just want you to know that I love you, and so did your dad. 3.41 p.m. on the same date. Lori, what happened? 3.43 p.m. We are still waiting for the ME report. I'll let you know more when I can. 5.54 p.m. Lori, what the fuck happened? You can't just tell us out dad died and disappeared. You're not too busy to just 
let us know he died and disappear. Why did you include this particular series of um, chats in your summary? For timeline purposes, this series of communications took place the day following Charles Vallow's death. And um, it is uh, indicative of the communication from Lori Vallow to Charles Vallow's sons regarding their father's death, but excludes the manner of death. Now, um, within a, did you, let's move ahead. Um, in terms of in, within a few hours of then on July 13th, um, could you tell us what we're seeing in the SMS section of Lally Time uh, at, at iCloud.com? Yes, this is a, a series of texts uh, between Chad Daybell, Lori Vallow, and ultimately Melanie Boudreaux, subsequent to Charles Vallow's death, um, Brandon Boudreaux, Melanie Boudreaux's husband, brought an individual to the house to talk with Melanie, and this series of texts re is in regards to that person. Okay. And uh, Lori Vallow was a part of this text communication, correct? Yes. Okay. Um, and it was a text communication between Lori and Chad and included Melanie Boudreaux. Correct. Okay. Could you please read those in the record? Yes. Line 3002 from Chad Bay Daybell to Lori Vallow. I will check all Bloomer and husband. Line 3001 from Lori Vallow to Chad Daybell. Good idea. Line 3000 from Chad Daybell to Lori Vallow. Ali Bloomer is 4.1 dark. Her cop husband is 3 dark. I suppose Brandon doesn't know yet about the discovered Charles's texts. Line 2996 from Lori Vallow to Melanie Boudreaux. Ali Bloomer's husband, 3, and then a dark emoji. And so um, these texts, you know, involving Chad, Lori, and then ultimately Melanie Boudreaux were between 9.30 p.m. and around 10.05 p.m. on the 13th, correct? Yes. Okay. And why did you include these texts between that time in your summary? I included them because they demonstrate that um, anyone who tried to intercede was identified as dark. I don't understand how... No, I'm going to object. That's speculative, and we're now getting into the weeds. I'll sustain that, and we should have the answer stricken, I presume. Thank you, Your Honor. Yes. All right. The uh, previous answer will be stricken, not to be considered by the jurors. Okay. So um, did you have an in context of the iCloud, did it reflect who Allie Bloomer was? Allie Bloomer was a friend of Melanie Boudreaux. Okay. And oh, excuse Boone. me, Brandon Boudreaux. Okay. And um, and did you learn whether or not Allie Bloomer had approached Melanie Boudreaux about her um, situation with Lori Vallow? It was Brandon Objection Boudreaux. Objection here, say judge. Overruled. <laughs> it was Brandon Boudreaux who brought Allie Bloomer and her husband, who was a police officer, over to the house to talk to Melanie Boudreaux. And then this text communication reflects reaching out by Lori Vallow and Chad Vallow um, and ultimately to Lori, to Melanie Boudreaux about the sort of status of Allie Bloomer and her husband. Correct. Those two individuals visited the Boudreaux residence and they were identified as dark. Okay. Now, sticking within this team, same time frame within... Um, you know, a day, day and a half of Charles Vallow's text. There were other texts or SMS that you considered, Melanie? Yes. Can you tell us what we're seeing as reflected in line 2967 from July 13th? Yes, this is a text between Chad Daybell uh, and, or a text from Chad Daybell to Lori Vallow um, regarding 
plans for the two of them to get together. Can you please read that? Yes. Lawrence? Line 2967. Concerning the two weeks, BYU Idaho's graduation is July 23rd. Adam is getting his bachelor's and Leah and Joe are getting their associates. They are all walking in the same commencement ceremony. I feel she will be gone by then, but I will still have that hoopla to deal with because a lot of my and Adam's family are coming and will stay for July 24th. So I believe that's why the Lord hinted I might not get to be with you until that is over. Please ask about that. And were there additional texts associated with that conversation? Yes. Are we seeing those on the next slide? There, there's a series, uh, the next few slides, I believe. Okay. If you could, um, what's the next date and time of that text in this series of communication between Chad and Lori? Uh, July 14th of 2019. Could you read the text into the record, please? Yes. Line 2962 from Chad Daybell to Lori Vallow. Good morning, my most beautiful Lily. Thanks for joining me in the shower this morning. Wow. Getting ready to leave for my meetings. Does noon your time look like a time we could talk? I love you so immensely that the whole universe knows it. And very soon, the people on this little blue globe will know it too. Line 2961. Morning, sunshine. Sure. Call me if you get a chance. And that's from Lori Vallow to Chad Daybell. And um, let's move to the, I believe this is the rest of the series. It is the rest of the series, but then it gets into also another aspect of the iCloud accounts. Okay. Um, if we could finish the series and then we'll go back and finish this aspect, is that okay? Okay. okay, so the last in the series would be uh, 2935 from Chad Day Daybell to Lori Vallow. I love you so much. You are my greatest desire and my best friend. Now on with the story. Okay. So turning back to what began with the series, um, why did you include this, this series? of text communications from Chad and to Lori and vice versa? I included this uh, due to the reference that um, Chad Dable stated, I feel she will be gone by then. And then at the end, I believe that's why the Lord hinted I might not get to be with you until that is over. Um, what relevance did it have in terms of your review of the iCloud and the evidence um, overall? The reference to Tammy Daybell being gone and the ability for Chad Daybell and Lori Vallow to be together at a future oh, point. I'm going to object to speculation and ask that it be stricken. I'll sustain that. Um, so following up on that, had you seen previous texts and communications or heard from witnesses that Chad Daybell had told people Tammy Daybell was going to die? From witnesses that were interviewed, yes. We heard repeatedly that Chad Daybell had told numerous persons that Tammy Daybell Objection, was... Objection, that's hearsay, Judge. That's a, go ahead, Ms. Smith. Thank you. Go ahead. No, I'm sorry. Uh, if you want to argue in response to the... Oh, thank speech. you. You know, this is this is part of the relevance of a summary of an agent. It has to be viewed in context of the evidence overall. We aren't offering the statement that Tammy was going to be die for the truth that um, the person said it. What we're doing is to put this text and this communication in conversation, uh, in communication, uh, in context. Sorry, put this communication in context of what the co-conspirators are discussing. And so while defense counsel's argument is that it's speculation in context of his knowledge, his experience, his analysis, his looking at all of the iClouds, it's not speculation. Well, it, was, it was hearsay was the specific objection lodged. Well, and your honor, it's a statement of a co-conspirator. Okay. In yeah. furtherance of conspiracy. 
I'm asking, court, well, okay, go ahead, Mr. Go ahead. I guess I'm just saying, I'm, I'm, I'm saying what he's, he's saying is that the information that he got from other people that Tammy was going to die is hearsay. That was his response. No, that wasn't his response, Your Honor. All right, counsel, I'm going to sustain the objection. You can ask another question. Ms. Okay. Had you learned from the review of iCloud and information that Chad Daybell told people that Chad, in his own words, said that Tammy was going to die? Yes. Okay. And knowing that information, did that put this text and mess SMS message in context? Yes. Okay. Um, there's also a line that says, please ask about that. What, if any, significance did, you, did that line have to you? During the course of the communications, there were several times where Chad and Lori would uh, ask one another to seek confirmation of a specific um, plan or event that may take place in the future. And so um, in this, con this is an example where Chad is asking Lori's advice. He's asking her to ask about what he's just laid out. Okay. Um, the next in that series has a line, good morning, my most beautiful Lily. What, if any, significance did that line have to you? Um, both Chad Daybell and Lori Vallow had multiple names that they used for one another. Uh, Chad was known as Chad Daybell, Raphael, and James. Lori Vallow was known as Lily and Elena. So they would call each other these names in between, in between various texts? Yes. For the most part, Lily was used very frequently by Chad Daybell uh, in reference to Lori Vallow. Okay. And... Um, is this discussion of thanks for joining me in the shower this morning evidence that Lori was physically with Chad? No. Objection, that's calling for speculation. Sustained. Do you know or have information on July 14th, 2019 at 7.42 in the morning whether Lori Vallow was physically with Chad Daybell? She was not. She was in Arizona. Okay. And looking at this text, is it uncommon between the two that they would imply they had been with each other when physically that was impossible. That's correct. Is there any other reason of significance to you why you included this particular part of the text string? The reference by Chad Daybell that soon the people on this little blue globe will know how much he loved Lori Vallow. Why was that significant? It's directly relevant to their relationship with one another and their plans together in the future. Your Honor, he's making a, I'm going to object. I think he's making a conclusion that's best made by the jury itself, not by a witness. All right. Well, the objection's not timely, so overruled. Thank you. Now, turning to sort of the end of, of this line of text communication, um, you indicated, I love you so much. You are my greatest desire and best friend. Now, on with the story. Um, what did that mean? In the iCloud, in the SMS section, as well as the email section, there is a story authored by Chad Daybell entitled The James and Elena Story. It is um, partly accurately historical as to real events, and it is partly fantasy. And so this is a segment that Chad Daybell sent to Lori Vallow on July 14th of 2019 that uh, contains a, a part of this James and Elena story. And you, in your summary, didn't include the whole story of James and Elena? No, I did not. How did you, why did you pick portions? I picked those portions that I felt were illustrative of how Chad Daybell and Lori, Day, uh, Lori Vallow met and some of the significant events that occurred early on in their relationship that were journaled or chronicled by Chad Daybell. Okay. 
And so um, these portions had relevance in terms of timing and when he sent them? Not so much on timing of when he sent them versus the contents. Okay. And um, but these were sent. This one, the, the, I, I believe, we're seeing one one of those text on um, line two ninety nine. I'm sorry, twenty nine thirty three um, from Chad Daybell to Roy Vallow on July fourteenth, two thousand nineteen. Correct. Um, less than three days after her husband died. Correct. Okay. Could you please read that into the record? Yes, line twenty nine thirty three text from Chad Daybell to Lori Vallow. They would both attend the same event in mid-November, and it seemed like that day would never arrive. Each day they opened their hearts to each other a little more. James knew he could trust her with the mysteries of the universe that had been revealed to him. He knew they had been married before, and they had been close friends with the Savior when he lived in Jerusalem. James had served in an important position in the Lord's Church, and Elena had been his beloved spouse and best friend. That relationship was now meant to continue in this lifetime. Okay. And did that, that um, text exchange between Marie and Chad continue? Yes. And that was at uh, July 14th at 3.05, the next one. Correct. Okay. Could you please read that one into the record? Yes, line 2930. Text from Chad Daybell to Lori Vallow. <clears throat> As James and Elena talked on the phone, he tried to delicately describe their connection to each other, and he was delighted that she believed him. He also shared that they had been married at other times on a previous world, and she accepted that information as well. James was overjoyed to have these memories restored to him because he truly loved her with all of his heart. He knew they were meant to be married again and complete important missions together before the second coming. He was ecstatic that she was receiving confirmation of these things as well. As they talked on the phone, the spiritual connection was so intense that it also produced physical desires and it was as if their spirits were making love despite the great distance between them. James knew his spirit was visiting her during those occasions. He also became the aware... The misstates, misstates the actual text. It was misread. I'm sorry, what did I misread? If, if you want to just start again, James knew his spirit. We don't need to start all over again. All right. James knew his spirit was visiting her during those conversations. He also became aware that his spirit would visit her at night and they would wrap around each other in a sensual embrace. Kissing her was so wonderful and real and he knew that the next time they saw each other, he needed to kiss her. He wouldn't be able to resist holding her. He was absolutely in love with her in every way. Why did you include those fraction of the James and Helena story in your summary? I included those because of the insight they give into the way in which uh, Chad Daybell and Lori Vallow met and how their relationship began. Okay. Turning to the next lines in um, Molly time, but down line 2915, from July 14th, 2019. Could you please um, read what's included in slide 13? Yes. Line 2915, text from Chad Bay Daybell to Lori Vallow. Hanging in there, but really missing you too. Please find out the name of Mel's campout in Utah. I have no intention of going, but I feel it is our avenue to get together whether she is still here or not. Line 2914 from Lori Vallow to Chad Daybell. Zion's family camp. Mel speaks Wednesday night and Dave speaks Thursday night. Shelly M is their main speaker, I roll. Line 2913 from Chad Daybell to Lori Vallow. 
Well, that should work for me to get away, though. I spoke at it two years ago, which is when I first met Mel. What time do you fly out tomorrow? Line 2913 from Chad Daybell to Lori Vallow. My trip to speak at the camp July 24th through 26 has been approved and is now on the calendar. Why did you include in that series of uh, text between Chad Daybell and Lori Vallow in your summary? During the course of the investigation, we discovered travel um, that Chad Daybell undertook July 24th through the 26th, where he flew to Arizona to visit Lori Vallow. This is the um, story that he came up with to justify his travel. Did their texting continue on that 14th? It did. Um, can you please identify in reading the record what is contained on slide 14? Line 2889 from Chad Vabel to Lori Vallow. I need so badly to just gently kiss you for hours. Line 2888 from Chad Vabel to Lori Vallow. It would likely lead to other activities. Line 2887 from Lori Vallow to Chad Daybell, likely or luckily, line 2886 from Chad Daybell to Lori Vallow, it would luckily lead to nakedness. So this text exchange between Chad Daybell and Lori Vallow occurred on July 14th around 8.30 at night? Correct. Okay, and that's of 2019? Yes. Okay. Just about three days after Charles Vallow was killed? Correct. Um, can you please identify um, and reading the record what's in the chat, chat section of the Lawyer for Style on line um, 27, 2127? Yes, this is a continuation of the chat between Lori Vallow, Cole Vallow, and Zach Vallow on July 15th, 2019. Okay, Lori, it's been three days. You let us know our father passed away over a text message. Three days and we haven't heard from anyone. The only information we have is that one text from you saying he passed away. You disappeared after that. We need any information you have. What happened? When did it happen? How did it happen? Where is he now? Are there any funeral plans? And can Zach and I be part of it? We talked to him all the time and now he's gone. He was our dad and we loved him very much. We deserve answers. Also, why have you been the only one to contact us? We haven't heard from Colby or Tylee. I know they are affected too. I called Colby recently too, but he didn't answer. Is JJ safe and what does he know? I need to be kept in the loop about this all. This isn't a nonchalant topic you can just throw a text at and be done with it. Okay. Why did you include this particular chat from Lori for Style in your summary? Mainly just to show the communication between her and Charles Vallow's children and uh, the fact that she did not communicate what had taken place. Okay. And so she had communicated on July 12th with them about their father dying? Correct. Did you find evidence that she gave them any information um, in the text that you saw from July 12th to July 14th about what happened to their father? No. But the text that we saw between her and Melanie Boudreaux and her and Chad had occurred in the, that intervening period? Correct. In that intervening period, did you see any evidence um, in her text communication with the people of sorrow or regret or remorse over Charles Vallow's death? Objection, it's not relevant. Sorrow, remorse, it's and re sorrow, remorse and regret are consciousness of guilt and are highly relevant to a defendant's state of mind. It's moved to strike and it's also speculative. Yeah, okay, first. No speaking objections or responses, please. So the objection is overruled. 
in the text messaging and the account that you saw of Lily Vallow from the time she notified Charles Vallow's sons on July 12th of his death to the time that Charles Vallow's sons reached out on July 15th. Did you find any evidence or evidence of remorse, regret, or um, sorrow in the defendant's communications with anyone? Your Honor, I'm, I'm going to object. I believe that's the jury's province to decide that. Overruled. None. Your Honor, we're transitioning to another section. I, I certainly can do that, but that will take more than five minutes. This might be a decent stopping place if you want us to end at noon. Okay. Why don't we go ahead and uh, do that since it appears it will be more time for this witness starting back Monday. So we will adjourn for the day. Um, before we do that, noting we're going into the weekend, let me just again uh, – address our jurors here. We continue to appreciate the long service you've provided in this case. Uh, it's important for you to follow the instruction upon the commencement of the day and through the weekend till we return Monday. Please do not discuss the case amongst yourselves or with anyone else during the time between now and when you return. Please do not follow the case at all if you see it in the media. Don't do anything to look up the case. Uh, access any other information that could impair your ability to decide this case only upon the evidence that you're hearing here in court today. So with that admonishment in mind, we will go ahead and recess for the day with the plan to start back with additional evidence Monday morning at 8.30. All right, please. Uh, no, his name is John Thomas, but uh, John Thomas is uh, British slang for uh, male anatomy and uh, named after some um, Victorian era womanizer. Um, so after after Prince Harry and, and his constant references to uh, his his Todger, um, the nickname is kind of stuck for for poor old John Thomas. So um, <laughs> that concludes uh, uh, the session. Uh, the court will be back in on. Uh, tomorrow, but we won't get that late in the day, so I'll be playing that on Tuesday. Um, I might do a pop-up live if it looks like uh, we're getting a verdict in the Letitia Stout trial. So, um, you know, keep an eye open for that. Um, I, I can't see how it can be anything but guilty. Quite frankly, I think that they didn't want to appear to be rushing their decision. And so they, they went, okay, well, let's order a couple of meals first off, you know, the, the state's dime and, and uh, then, then we'll come in with the guilty verdict. But <laughs> um, so, um, and, and I think I'm going to spend the rest of the day binge watching uh, the Stout trial. I've seen a lot of the, uh, defense uh, witnesses blundering uh, their way through uh, trying to say that she is psychotic at the time and blah, 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 blah. And yeah, I'm sorry, this, this 85 year old psychiatrist who doesn't even have a license to practice in the state of Colorado. Um, I think she's senile if she believes um, Letitia is a genuinely a multiple personality. So <laughs> it's, uh, it was good to have, uh, have you join and uh, we'll see you hopefully tomorrow for a verdict and, and Tuesday for, for the trial. I, I keep thinking we're going to be wrapping up. Somebody was predicting maybe the, the prosecution would wrap up on Tuesday. 
So um, fingers crossed. Um, and um, we'll see you soon. Um, have a, a pleasant uh, rest of your Sunday. Bye-bye.